Hello, snake appreciators, or soon to be snake appreciators. Welcome to the very first panel of our Snake Patrick's Day lineup of live programming. Um, this one is titled Snakes and Primates, Mysterious Rattlers, and Malagasy Gem Snakes, which I think actually could that can be more expansive. But um, for this for this uh, program, we are so pleased to welcome a trio of really heavy hitting snake scientists. Um, so I would like to introduce faces that are about to pop up on screen. Harry Green, who is an emeritus professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at Cornell. And prior to going to Cornell, you were for two decades professor and curator at the University of California Berkeley Museums of Vertebrate Zoology, right close to the academy. Welcome, Harry. Thank you so much for being here today. Happy to be here. Excellent, thank you. And next up, we are welcoming, <laughs> there you are, Dr. Uh, Jacobo Reyes Velasco, a postdoctoral researcher at NYU Abu Dhabi, and um, very excited to hear your, I like the present, the title of your talk, I have to say wins, wins, just overall. <laughs> The title of your talk is Drugs, Drugs, Guns, and Rattlesnakes Unraveling the Mysterious Long-Tailed Rattlesnakes in the Mountains of Mexico. So you get all the points for drama. I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, and we'll see you in a moment. And then our uh, last um, panelist today is Dr. Philip Skipwith. Hello. Uh, Professor at the University of Kentucky, where you focus on squamate reptiles to understand the mechanisms of diversification within lineages. But more importantly, happy anniversary to you and Veronica. And I uh, heard a rumor that our curator of uh, herpetology, Dr. Raina Bell, who is responsible for Snake Patrick's Day, sent you kind of a special present. Is that right? Yes, it's scared, scared is very good, so. Okay, so this is for, for people who can't kind of fill in the dot, this is, um, the infamous can of snakes, which I heard was terrifying for both you and your dog. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I should tell you that we initially looked into sending all panelists cans of snakes that we wanted to have them open live on air, but in the end, we just settled on you. So hope you appreciated that. I feel special though. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Okay. Fantastic. So I think um, with that, I will uh, kind of launch into our series of presentations because we have a lot of amazing stuff to cover today. But viewers, um, you can ask our panelists questions at any time. If you're watching on Facebook, just leave those in the comment section. And if you're watching on YouTube, just leave those in the chat box. And we're going to loop back and ask all of those at the end. Um, but first, we're going to start with a series of kind of 15-minute flash science talks on these different areas of expertise. So you are about to learn a lot about snakes. Um, and we are going to begin with, in alphabetical order, Dr. Green, who we will welcome back to the screen. All right, thank you again. Uh, thanks so much, Laurel. I'm really happy to be here. And before I move on from my title slide, I want uh, everybody watching to just briefly notice this left-hand photograph. We're looking at a South African python about 10, 12 feet long, and it's constricting and will swallow that vervet monkey that weighs about 50% of its mass. Now, I, th I think a lot of people would look at that picture, even probably some of you have kept pet snakes and fed them frozen mice and so forth, might look at that picture and say, absolutely impossible, that monkey's way too big for that snake. In fact, as far as wild prey items go, that's a sort of ordinary size prey for a snake of that mass in terms of relative prey size. So keep that in mind as we move along. I'm a natural historian. I spent the last 40, 50 years studying snakes, mostly in the field, also in museums. Spent a lot of time at the Calicad looking in stomachs of preserved museum specimens and so forth. The kind of thing I like doing most is watching snakes in the field. And uh, here is a little panel of photographs of me two years ago in the Kalahari with some colleagues studying the foraging behavior of Cape Cobras. This is a, oh, roughly five to seven foot long, uh, highly venomous, species and it turns out it eats a lot of vipers including puff adders and we were fortunate to watch this cape cobra spend about 36 hours repeatedly relocating envenoming and eventually consuming that puff adder so that's what i do as a professional biologist as well as teach and engage in outreach and today i'm just going to tell you a little bit about one of my recent fascinations it involves sort of veering into anthropology more than 10 years ago and becoming engaged in what's called the snake detection theory. 
this is first put forward by Lynn Isbell, uh, an anthropologist at UC Davis. And it involves a couple of stages I'm going to describe to you and show some of the sort of natural history evidence that goes along with this. We need to start by talking just a little bit about primates. We're primates, as you probably understand, and primates are mammals. So when we ask what's special about primates, we have to compare them with their closest living relatives, which turn out to be some uh, animals in Indonesia called kalugos or, or flying uh, lemurs. Uh, more distantly, primates are related to tree shrews and then to rodents and rabbits. So you, when you compare primates to all these other mammals, turns out that they have more flexible shoulders, they have grasping hands and feet, they have bigger brains relative to their body size, they have what's called orbital convergence, which means that their eyes sort of come together and focus together, allowing for greater visual uh, acuity. They have vision controlled grasping. And what this means is this is this is surprising, perhaps, but it turns out when a rodent like a squirrel lifts something to its mouth or its face like a nut, it's actually guiding its hands by chemical cues by odor. When a primate guides something to its face, to its hands, uses, uses its hands to grab something, it's using vision. We are super visual organisms. It turns out along with this, at the level of all primates and as a further specialization within primates, we have snake-specific recognition mechanisms, some of which are pre-conscious. That is to say, well, let me back up and just say, although many people assume or think that we're innately afraid of snakes, it's it's actually not clear that that's true. It's not clear the extent to which experience modifies that. But what is clear is that we have innate neurobiological mechanisms for recognizing snakes at surprisingly uh, difficult situations. And these differences I've just described, fl from flexible shoulders to snake-specific recognition mechanisms, are all enhanced within monkeys and apes, which are our closest relatives within primates. So here's the snake detection theory uh, in brief. And the first part is that uh, primates arose about 75 million years ago. If you look in the lower left of this slide, you're looking at what we call the primate tree of life. And just to sort of quickly orient you to how to look at these trees of life, uh, we had an ancestral primate about 75 million years ago, which diverged into two lineages. One includes the lemurs and their relatives, one includes everybody else, including monkeys, apes, and us. When that happened, we know from studies of snake biology that there were already present on Earth constricting serpents with a mouth apparatus capable of swallowing a relatively large mammal. So when primates evolved, we, were, we, we evolved in a context in which snakes were already there waiting for us. Now, just to, just to elaborate slightly on what I've just said, Again, when I say eating heavy prey, I mean things that weigh 40, 50, 60, 70, up to about 100% of the predator's mass in the case of living boas and pythons. That boa constrictor you're looking at in this picture here is swallowing a white-tailed deer fawn. And I've seen the photographs of this entire ingestion process for this snake. And when it's over, that snake is, is not stuffed. It looks heavy bodied, but it doesn't look like it has a really huge object in it. And that's because it's eaten something that only weighs about 40% of its own mass. And we know from studying across the snake tree of life, which is shown in the upper right hand panel, that all these relatively basal lineages, the ones encompassed by the green reptile, rept, uh, rectangle, they all are capable of constriction and they all are capable of eating relatively bulky, heavy prey. And that's why we infer that when primates arose, they did that in the context of something already able to kill them. Now, let me show you a couple of examples how we know these kinds of things. If we take the longest known living snake, the reticulated python, we have quite a lot of data on what these snakes eat. And a single individual reticulated python throughout its lifetime, depending on where it lived, might feed on those flying lemurs called colagos, a couple of species of tree shrews, lorises, which are lemur relatives, tarsiers, long-tailed macaques, a couple of kinds of langurs, siamangs, Sumatran orangs, and even humans. So a single reticulated python, although they are not specialized on primates, might eat quite a variety of them. Shown here in this picture, you can see a reticulated python that was killed and opened and found to have eaten a nursing long-tailed macaque and the macaque's infant, which is up here. 
Here's one more example. There are several species of boas in Madagascar, and the largest species, the Madagascan ground boa, reaches about 10 feet in total length, commonly eats various kinds of lemurs. What you're looking at in the lower left, larger image here, is a Madagascan ground boa known as Big George, who lived on the grounds of an ecotourism lodge in Madagascar, was seen many times over a 10 year period, uh, feeding on lemurs like this brown lemur in the picture. And then one day, some uh, personnel of this ecotourism lodge spotted eight cockerel shifox, sifakas, uh, marching in a line down a little grassy trail, and unknown to both the shifox and the observers, Big George was lying in wait. Big George picked out the third shifox, happened to be a pregnant female, snatched the shifox, began constricting, and what Big George hadn't counted on was that these are highly social primates, they quickly come to each other's defense. The rest of the shefox jumped on Big George, who was distracted enough that the bitten potential victim in turn bit Big George in the head, escaped, and a few months later gave birth to a normal young, whereas Big George died from her injuries. Now, the second part of the snake detection theory involves a really major innovation in snake evolution, something that happened about 35 to 50 million years ago and that is the origin of front fangs. It happened three times. There are lots of other snakes that can inject venom, but these three lineages, possibly four, but probably three lineages of uh, highly venomous front fang snakes uh, carry a special ability to, to uh, deliver pain to an adversary. So we're talking about something that happened in the snake tree of life 35 to 50 million years ago. A little more recently in that, is when the anthropoids arose. This is the new and old world monkeys, the gibbons, uh, greater apes, and us. So again, we're looking at a shift in snake biology, which not too long after was, was followed by a shift in primate biology. It is true we have some records of these front fang snakes occasionally killing, other, killing primates so as to eat them, but surely much more frequent is the, 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 the reality that we scare these primates I mean, sorry, that, that we scare these snakes and they, they bite us to defend themselves. So uh, just to elaborate on this a little bit, I'd like you to first pay attention to the two uh, high-speed video frames on the left. This is a timber rattlesnake filmed in captivity striking at a mouse. So this is a rattlesnake biting in a predatory context. But what you can see is there are less than two, sorry, there's about a hundred and, oh, a hundred and, 50 milliseconds or something between these frames. In a very short period of time, the fang tips strike the mouse and then they are released from the mouse. Now, if you've ever been bitten defensively by a non-venomous snake, you know that ordinary snake teeth are designed for hanging on. And a snake's problem, if it bites defensively, is actually to disengage from whomever it's bitten so as to not be uh, uh, injured or killed in retribution. What front fangs did for the snakes that possess them is not only allow them to strike prey and envenomate it really quickly, but it allowed them to deliver a punishing bite to a potential enemy like uh, a carnivore or a raptor or a primate. And again, up in the upper right here, you see the snake tree of life, but now I've encompassed in uh, a red rectangle in particular. Those are the only lineages within which front fangs arise. And like I told you three times, and a fascinating correlate of all this is that it's only within this group of snakes, the ones in which front fangs arise, that we get all these fancy defensive mechanisms like hoods and cobras and bite colors and coral snakes and rattles and other sound producing uh, mechanisms and various vipers. So front fangs probably arose as an adaptation primarily for feeding, but it's very clear they had the additional advantage of allowing snakes that possess them to defend themselves very quickly and with relatively little risk. So who's all that aimed at? And as someone who's been thinking about that for a very long time, I think most of my adult, most of my career, I imagine that all these defensive behaviors of snakes were directed at uh, carnivores like uh, foxes and bobcats and so forth. Maybe certain raptors like uh, um, secretary birds and various hawks. But I'm now thinking more and more that we primates may be the real movers and shakers in snake evolution because in addition to being like those other predators, highly visual, acoustically sophisticated, 
moderately to very cognitive. In addition to all those things, we are super social preemptive weapon wielders. When you get to the anthropoids within primates, you see over and over again, the ability to pick up things like sticks and rocks and use them as clubs and spears and projectiles in defending the primates against adversaries. In particular, it turns out primates do this in response to snakes. There's actually an observation. Some of you may know what a fur lance is, more uh, typically called today a terciopelo in middle America. It's a super dangerous uh, pit viper in a group called the lanceheads, reaches a maximum length of five to seven feet. We have a record in the literature of white-faced capuchins using sticks as clubs to kill an adult female fertile ants, an amazing accomplishment. Uh, here's another example. Now we're going from Central America to Eastern South America. These are bearded capuchin monkeys who've stu been studied in detail by uh, uh, Falachico and colleagues. And in these two photographs, you can see something really incredible. On the left is a male bearded capuchin uh, He's just caught and dispatched some kind of uh, harmless colubrid snake, probably a vine snake, watching very intently as a female with an offspring on her back. And the message essentially, we know this from Falochico's studies, is that this snake is one of the harmless kinds. We kill them and eat them. Over in the right, you see some bearded capuchins from the same study. They've located a pit viper mimic. It turns out that capuchins basically identify two kinds of snakes. This is their taxonomy. One kind of snake includes boa constrictors, vipers, and coral snakes, things that can kill them. And the other kind of snake is everybody else. So when a bearded capuchin encounters the other kind of snake, they kill it and eat it. When they encounter a boa, a viper, or viper mimic, or a coral snake, they take up arms, they poke it, they harass it, they throw things at it, they drive it away if at all possible. Now, where does this all lead us? Well, I, I think... Uh, snakes have actually had a huge impact on primate evolution, beginning with the origin of primates, coming up to some much more recent events. I'm just going to show you a couple of examples. This is from a paper I recently published with a number of colleagues. It has to do with the origin of spitting cobras. Spitting cobras are really special among snakes. If we look among snakes globally, we see a consistent pattern of convergent evolution of defensive behavior. I could take you to tropical rainforest in Southeast Asia, in South America, in Equatorial Africa, and I could show you unrelated snakes doing roughly the same thing, like being a tree snake, with very similar defensive displays, over and over and over, various kinds of displays. And yet, with all that convergent evolution, all that diversification, spitting the only long-distance defense among all snakes has evolved only three times. And it's evolved only within this group called the Afro-Asian cobras. And what we found was that the mechanisms of spitting morphologically, that is in terms of the anatomy of the jaws and the teeth, and the biochemistry of spitting, the pharmacology of spitting, how these various molecular components of spit or venom affect an adversary, have evolved three times. They've evolved three times in very similar ways. And that suggests there might be some similar cause, some similar selective factor. And we think we've identified a really good candidate. And that is, first of all, the divergence of the chimp lineage from the human lineage about seven to eight million years ago, shown in the pink vertical bar here. Second of all, the arrival of our close, close relative, Homo erectus, in Asia, something like two million years ago. There's a third lineage of spitter in Africa, but we don't know when spitting arose on that very long branch that you see at the top there, the first uh, listing of Africa. So we, we can't check our hypothesis against that one yet. And my final example involves uh, actually two examples. Uh, I think many herpetologists probably like me really didn't imagine primates and even people mattered much vis-a-vis -vis snakes. And I think we might be misled to feel that way because most of us, herpetologists that is, until recent times, were privileged to live, grow up, and so forth in countries where snake bite is not a big problem. But we know now that it can be a very large problem. There's a study sometime back of Ecuadorian Warani, indigenous people in the Amazonian region of Ecuador. They used a type of immunological survey, looked at blood samples, and showed that about half of all adult male Warani had survived at least 
one serious snake bite and about 50% of them had survived two or more snake bites. Just think about that. That's an incredible impact on the lifestyles of a people living uh, uh, a hunter gatherer lifestyle to have the likelihood of being bitten by a venomous snake approaching 100% for adult males. Here's another example shown in the right hand figure that I worked on. It involves some people called the Agta in northern Luzon in the Philippines. Until the 1960s, the Agta lived as semi, uh, as, as pre-literate, semi-nomadic hunter-gatherers in a rainforest environment. They ate mainly deer, pigs, and, uh, and snakes, and monkeys. And uh, among the snakes they eat are these big reticulated pythons, like the female shown here on the right. I collaborated with an anthropologist, Thomas Edlin, who had studied these people, learned their language, and lived with them during the 60s. And Tom had, had interviewed 120 agta, of whom 26% of the adult males had survived python attacks. Just think about it. A quarter of all the adult males in this group had been bitten and managed to escape from predatory attacks from reticulated pythons. During the time, he asked all these people, um, now, of course, you don't do this kind of ethnographic survey by asking leading questions like, have you been attacked by a python? You ask questions like, please tell me all the people you know of who have died and what you know of in terms of their cause of death. When Tom asked that, it turned out there had been six fatalities from reticulated pythons during the, the lives of these 120 agta, two of which occurred while he was working with the people. So once again, just imagine the effect on on people's attitudes about snakes. If you lived in a place where in order to do your daily hunting, hunting and gathering, you had the constant risk of all of a sudden having a 20, 25 foot snake try to seize you out of the vegetation. Well, I'm gonna close by just saying how studying these kinds of things uh, has affected my own attitudes about trying to convince people to appreciate snakes. I spent most of my career as a scientist and as a teacher basically arguing that Snake bite is not really a problem. Uh, we know how to avoid it. We know how to treat it. It's, it's certainly not a public health problem in the United States. And for many years, I used this quote as a sort of, uh, a sort of emblematic of how I felt uh, research and education come together to help inspire appreciation for even dangerous animals. It's from a Senegalese conservationist, Baba Dion, who said, we will conserve what we love, love what we understand, and understand what we're taught. Uh, here you see my friend John Hewlett and his daughters looking at a, a venomous pit viper in Kentucky, as a matter of fact. Now I've come to think that it's really a little more complicated, that we will conserve what we love, but it's got to be something we no longer have serious reasons to fear. We'll love what we understand, and it needs to not be too risky anymore. And we'll understand what we're taught to appreciate safely. So uh, thanks for listening to my stories about uh, primates and snakes, and I look forward to what the other panelists have to say and to uh, listening to your questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Green. Um, and, uh, oh, actually, I'm going to bring you back on screen for just a second. Let's see here. Or I think I might be having a little bit of internet trouble. Christina, if you're back of host, or if you're back of house, can you? Oh, Dr. Green, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. I can't hear you very well for some reason. How about now? Um, but if everybody else, let's say, Christina, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear Dr. Green? Okay. So I can't for some reason, which is a little scary. One second. Yeah. I think it, it's not you, Dr. Green. It's me. One sec. Okay. I'm going to pop on just because we can't hear you, Laurel. <laughs> Sorry, can't, Harry, can you hear her? I cannot. I can hear you. No. Okay. Yeah, we can't hear you right now, Laurel. But. But I don't know. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Um, I don't know what, uh, I don't know what she was going to ask you. I'm sure it was going to be great. Um, but Harry, thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker now. And so Harry, I'm going to take you off screen, but we will see you at the end. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay. Up next, um, we're going to kick it to um, Jacobo Reyes Velasco, who is live streaming in from Colima, Mexico. So I'm going to add you to the screen. Hi. Um, Hi, everybody. And then, <laughs> and then I'm going to throw up your slides and uh, yeah, talk to you. All later. right. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just hit this. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Raina Bell for the original um, invitation. And I also want to thank Jason Jones and Ricky for helping me put this uh, series of slides together. So <clears throat> let's get started. Uh, I am from the west coast of Mexico, from a small town and state called Colima. You've probably never heard of it. You've probably been to Cancun or Puerto Vallarta or maybe Cabo. So Colima is a little bit farther south from Puerto Vallarta, and it's also much prettier. Um, so we have a huge volcano. Um, it's a small state, but it's, it's actually quite diverse. So I grew up here. And I love, you know, chasing lizards, uh, trying to catch frogs and, and whatnot. Uh, but the biggest prize was catching uh, freshwater turtles. So I don't know if um, this was because uh, I liked the Ninja Turtles when I was a little kid, or if I liked the Ninja Turtles because I like turtles. But anyhow, I like turtles so much that by the time I, uh, oops, by the time that I got to high school, I started uh, my own freshwater breeding center with a couple of friends from, from high school. And kind of like the goal here was to be able to breed the, the native species of turtles in my home state and teach other people how to breed them. So the local pet shops would not need to bring, uh, for example, red ear sli uh, sliders, uh, which are an exotic uh, species. And you might think like, well, what does this have to do with drug, uh, drugs, guns, and rattlesnakes? And I kind of want to uh, know myself. So back in the day, it was really complicated to get any type of uh, a PDFs of whatnot. So um, I started going online and, and meeting other people from other places. And among the people that I met were two young um, herpetologists from California, Chris Grunwell and Jason Jones. And back in 2004, uh, they decided to move down to Colima um, to, to look for snakes and stuff here. So Along with them, they brought this book by a guy called Jonathan Campbell, which I had never heard of before. It was called The Venomous Reptiles of the Western Hemisphere, and it was full of amazing pictures and information of venomous uh, snakes and, and most interestingly, rattlesnakes. So there were two species there that I was uh, completely, completely uh, kind of shot, and these were, uh, he referred to as the long-tailed rattlesnakes. And they were supposed to be uh, lost to science for a very long time or missing for many years, so that got me extremely intrigued in, in rattlesnakes and especially in these species. So the first one is called Curlus lanami or the outland rattlesnake. And it was only known from one specimen that was found dead on the road. It has never been seen alive. And some people believe that it was possibly extinct. Um, so I became like, you know, this is kind of like this mystery. And these species was supposed to have been found just kind of like right next door to, to my home state. And just to put this in perspective, um, so you probably heard of El Chapo. So he had been caught three times. So Carlos Lanami was even harder to find than El Chapo Guzman. So the other species in the book is called Carlos Tegnegeri, or the Sinaloan long-tailed rattlesnake. And these species have been known for over 100 years. Uh, however, it was only known from a handful of specimens, about 12 specimens. And, um, you know, nobody had seen it in more than 30 years. So it was, uh, it was kind of like a complete mystery. And, you know, it was fine to catch turtles and whatnot, but <clears throat> excuse me, I had an entire farm of turtles, but, but these rattlesnakes, nobody could find them. So several years after seeing this book, um, uh, Jonathan Campbell and Oscar Flores described the uh, long, Guerrero long-tailed rattlesnake, also known as Crowless Eric Smithi, in honor of Dr. Eric Smith. And I just have to say that I think probably this is the worst uh, name for a rattlesnake ever. Um, but this snake was also a mystery because it had been found uh, only once. And, you know, it, it, nobody really knew anything about it other than that one specimen that was found. So I'm just going to take a little break here and I'm just going to explain to you why they're called the long-tailed rattlesnakes. Uh, some of my friends here in Colima, they're like, well, what do you mean with long tail? 
uh, rattlesnakes or snakes are just a head and, and a tail, right? Well, but that's actually not the case. They have a head like us, they have a very elongated body like us, and they also have a tail. So in the case of the long-tailed rattlesnakes, as you can see here with my cursor, they have a long tail compared to other rattlesnakes, and they have a really small rattle. If you look at some other rattlesnakes, so for example, Curlus basiliscus, they have a much shorter tail and a much bigger rattle. So this kind of adds more to the mystery of these long-tailed rattlesnakes because their morphology is quite unique and very different from all the other rattlesnakes. So some people even kind of like uh, uh, guess that um, maybe they were an arboreal, maybe they lived up in the in the bushes or the trees, and the long tail helps them to you know kind of like uh, be able to climb better and whatnot. <clears throat> So why are these snakes so hard to find? Why had nobody found uh, Corollus lanami in over uh, 40 years? And same thing with uh, Corollus stegnegeri. Um, so this got me really, really excited and we started looking for them. And I think one of the first, uh, one of the things that helps answer why they were so hard to find is where they live. So it turns out that the rugged uh, foothills of Western Mexico are not only the home of long-tailed rattlesnakes, but they're also some of the uh, biggest production of drugs in Mexico. So if we look at the distribution of Curlus stegnegeri between Durango and Sinaloa, that's also one of the hot spots for production of uh, opium poppies and marijuana. Uh, also in the mountains of Jalisco, maybe not at the same uh, level, but in the south in Guerrero, that's also one of the biggest spots for opium poppy and marijuana production. And that's exactly the places where these snakes live. But I think that there might be another reason why at least one of those species was not uh, found so easy. Um, so we went to these places and sure enough, <clears throat> there was uh, a lot of uh, opium poppies uh, being grown, and not only the poppies, of course, there's also the people that take care of the fields, and they don't want outsiders to go venturing into their areas uh, where they're growing this, you know? So people are not welcome, and they have not been welcome to these areas for many, many years. Um, but what happened with uh, Curlus Um Yeah, it lives in some places that, you know, there's some, some production of, uh, of marijuana and opium poppies, but maybe not as much as the other two areas. However, uh, this species was described in 1966 by William Tanner, but the specimen was found by a guy named Joseph Lanham. So Joseph was traveling through southern Mexico, uh, catching uh, lizards during the day and looking for snakes at night. And while he was driving by himself on this uh, lonely road um, in Jalisco, well, actually it wasn't that lonely. It had actually quite a bit of traffic. He found, he stopped his car uh, because he found a dead snake. He picked it up. There were some cars coming, so he just tossed it in the back of his truck and he drove off. Um, and that snake turned out that was Corollus lanami, or what was later described as Corollus lanami. But the problem is that from the time that Joseph Lanham collected this specimen to the time that it got to William Tanner, there was kind of like miscommunication of the exact locality where this snake was found. So over the years, team after team of field herpetologists would come to the type of locality that William Tanner had provided, which was probably in error to where the snake was actually found. So I myself and my friends would go to this type of locality over and over again and keep uh, striking out. So we decided to look elsewhere and for many years we looked into some other mountains in Jalisco until we got tired of not finding anything and we decided to move back to my home state, to Colima. Um, and we looked for many, many years without finding anything until one really humid and hot morning uh, in the summer of 2008, we finally managed to find this long lost species. So here's me finding one of the first individuals of uh, Corollus lanami that, that we managed to rediscover. So we're extremely excited. Uh, we're really happy. Uh, we continued doing field work in this area and we managed to find more individuals. So even though we, we rediscovered them in 2008, we finally published um, the paper in 2010. So what about the other species of long-tailed rattlesnakes? Uh, we went back to Guerrero. Uh, this is one of the habitat shots of, of the places where the Guerrero long-tailed rattlesnakes live. Uh, and a year after it was uh, first described, we were able to find additional specimens of Corollus eric smithi. And we went north uh, to look for the Sinaloan long-tailed rattlesnake, Corollus stegnegeri. And uh, in 2011, we managed to find additional individuals. And funny enough, uh, the first individual that was found was really close to a marijuana field. So now we had all three species of long-tailed rattlesnakes, um, and we were gonna be able to answer some evolutionary questions about these guys. So because nobody had found them and because their morphology was really di uh, different from everything else, they were a complete mystery. So at this time, I had joined Jonathan Campbell at UT Arlington, and I was doing my PhD, and one of the first things that I started to do was look at the evolutionary relationships between the long tails and all the other rattlesnakes. Um, so some of the hypotheses that have been put out through the years was that perhaps 
these guys were so rare, maybe they were a missing link uh, between rattlesnakes, as I'm pointing out here, and other pit vipers. Uh, another hypothesis was that they were kind of like the sister group to Curlus polystictus, which is the Mexican lance-headed rattlesnake. Um, and the last hypothesis was that maybe the long tail evolved multiple times in rattlesnakes, and that the long tail species were not each other closest relatives. So I'm going to go straight to the chase here. And what we found was that all three previous hypotheses were completely wrong. Uh, the long tail rattlesnakes were each other closest relatives, so they did form a monophyletic group. But instead of being kind of like a missing link or closely related to Curlus polystictus, in fact, they were the sister group of these really big uh, rattlesnakes that live in northern Mexico and in the southern U.S., for example, the diamondback uh, rattlesnake. Uh, so the morphology was quite uh, different from everything else. And um, these kind of like analyses of understanding the evolutionary relationships of the long-tailed rattlesnakes also help us understand the evolutionary relationships of all other rattlesnakes. So, well, now we know a little bit about their evolutionary history, but what about their natural history? So we didn't really know much. So in grad school, I applied for a grant for the National Geographic and uh, to study the natural history of Curlus lanami. And I was awarded the grant. So I was extremely happy. You know, I was the happiest queen in the block. However, um, long-tailed rattlesnakes are not the only things that live in these mountains. And these areas are, are rich with iron ore deposits. So after years of fighting with this uh, big mine that wanted to put an, an open pit iron ore mine in, in my study site, uh, they finally got the permits. And, and overnight, I, I had to abandon the, the idea. I uh, destroyed my project of working with these long-tailed rattlesnakes and doing some radio telemetry and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So big uh, mining corporations are moving to a lot of these areas, and this is a huge problem, not only for long-tails, but for also for other species. Um, but mining is not the only problem for the conservation of these guys. Uh, a big problem is avocado farms. So I'm sure a lot of you guys love avocados. I love avocados. But every day, there's huge uh, uh, parts of forests that are being completely uh, taken down to grow some um, really intensive avocado farms. And, and you know, long-tail rattlesnakes, they might be able to survive some, some habitat degradation, but not to the level of these avocado farms. And last but not least in conservation concerns, and this might come as a surprise to you guys, is fentanyl. I don't know if you guys have heard about fentanyl. It's a synthetic opioid that's become extremely popular in the black market, especially in the US. Um, so the rise in fentanyl has dropped the prices of uh, opium poppies and opium gum. So these farmer, they like to, to preserve the forest before because it would keep their uh, fields hidden from the cops and the militaries. But now that you know the opium poppies were not giving them any money, they decided to start cutting down this forest to sell the lumber to be able to make some money. So that's been a, a extremely, um, uh, that has increased quite a bit in the recent years. Um, and this is not only a problem from long-tailed rattlesnakes, there's a lot of, a big problem for a bunch of other species that live in this forest. And for example, you can see that this picture is really pretty. Unfortunately, this is not morning mist that's rising through the mountains of uh, southern Mexico. This is just uh, the, the, the forest is being burned for agriculture and other practices. So this has a huge impact, not only for long-tailed rattlesnakes, but for other species. So these areas are extremely diverse. So for example, in the past couple of years, we've described three new species of frogs uh, that live in the Sierra Madre del Sur, where the, some of these long-tailed rattlesnakes live. Uh, we found two new species of uh, snakes uh, that we're working describing. Some other groups uh, have discovered new species of, um, of lizards. Uh, there's pumas, there's jaguars, there's pygmy uh, hummingbirds in this area. So it's a huge biodiversity hotspot. So what, what can we do? What, what, what conservation measures can be implemented? And this is really complicated, so there's more questions than answers. But one of the things that we're trying to do is to be able to buy some plots of land uh, in areas that are still kind of like pristine uh, in order to preserve at least a little bit of the habitat. And probably most importantly is to work with local um, communities uh, and, and to try to have them not sell their land and maybe grow some other cr crops that are not as devastating for the long tails and some other species instead of selling their, their uh, land to some mines. Um, so right now we're also working on several collaboration with other labs. So for example, we're working on the genomics and transcriptomics of long tails with the Chris Parkinson lab. Uh, we're also trying to understand better their diet and the evolution of diet in, in uh, rattlesnakes uh, with the help of, or actually we're helping Jesus Galando and Carvajal in this and also look at uh, venom um, in, in the long-tailed rattlesnakes with Edgar Neri and the lab of Alejandro 
Aragon. Um, and with that, I want to thank you. If you guys want to look at some of more of my research, um, you can check out my website at jacoborreyesvelasco.com. Uh, you can also check my Instagram. I am not that big into social media, but a lot of the people that I work with at HerpMX, uh, which is a non-for-profit organization that, that we put together, you can check their Facebook, their Twitter, their Instagram. Um, and I think I still have a few seconds left, so I just want to move a little commercial. Uh, with the help of the people at HerpMX, we've been putting a field guide to the herps of Colima together. And of course, it's going to include curlus lanamide. So if you guys are a big fans of curlus lanamide of the other long-tailed rattlesnakes, uh, we're going to have some of this information there. Um, so hopefully it'll be come out in the next couple of months. Um, and again, thank you guys. And um, I guess I'll wait till the end to have more questions. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Oh, yay. All right. Okay. <laughs> uh, Dr. Reyes Velasco, that was, that was so, um, like, you kind of crushed that 15-minute presentation. Thank you. You've got a lot of fans in the comments. Um, and I'm going to save questions that are more substantive about your research for the end. But I did want to ask a couple that came up for you and also for Dr. Green when he was on previously, which is, do you actually take antivenom into the field when you are um, doing field work? So unfortunately, most of the times I don't. Um, but we do have uh, anti-venom uh, available to us. So if we're going to go to some really remote mountains, which is kind of the plan this summer, we're definitely going to take some anti-venom. And in, in most places, you're maybe a couple of hours away from uh, from a hospital. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so we will see you at the end. Thank you so much. Um, and to Dr. Green, I just want to say that earlier when I, you couldn't hear me, that was just an elaborate setup. It was a joke. We just wanted to see how long you'd stay on there with someone pretending to talk to you. So you, you weathered that really well. Thank you very much. Um, and for our third flash science presentation, we would like to welcome to the screen, Dr. Philip Skiff with, um, hello. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll go ahead and hand this right over because they're eager to hear yours as well. And um, we'll see you in a few minutes. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Laurel, for having me, introducing me. Um, as I briefly introduced myself, I'm a new faculty member at the University of Kentucky, and my background is phylogenetics and comparative phylogenetics, um, focusing on squamate reptiles. You guys probably heard uh, Harry and Jacobo uh, talk about uh, uh, phylogenetics, so there's going to be a lot of phylogenies in my talk, so I'll do my best to just keep it really simple um, for the audience. So like I said, uh, my main research is building the tree of life for, rept uh, for squamate reptiles, which are snakes and lizards. Um, in the past, I've worked on geckos, and now I work on both geckos and snakes. Um, and in addition to building the tree of life and uh, understanding how different species are related, one of the things that I'm really interested in is how different lineages diversify. Why are some groups of organisms or clades, um, uh, assemblages of species that share a single common ancestor, um, are more diverse in terms of species and phenotype than others. Um, and there are a lot of processes that can play into that, but these processes on their very specific, um, uh, uh, group specific situations can lead to this phenomenon of adaptive radiations, which is uh, a, a aspect of my research is that is very prominent. And I'm just gonna briefly outline the ba very basic theory of adaptive radiation. Um, and that is that from a single common ancestor, a lineage of organisms, a clade, um, will diversify on the very clearly defined ecological um, axes. Um, and this is contrasted with, say, a non-adaptive radiation where you can have a single common ancestor, but then you have a bunch of species that look and do mostly, look the same and mostly do the same thing. So I've outlined it in this uh, snazzy little cartoon here, um, where on the top I have this non-adaptive radiation from a single common ancestor on the left. Um, you can see that these guys uh, sort of all look the same, even though they are clearly defined uh, populations or species. And then in adaptive radiation, you can have a single common ancestor, uh, uh, multiple species that do different things. And I, you know, here in this case, uh, color corresponds to their ecological niche and their size and shape correspond to their phenotype. Um, this is a very simple situ um, situation, but it's something that we see in nature a lot. So a great example of that would be anolis lizards in the Caribbean, where you have giants that lives at the, live at the top of trees and little spindly guys that live in the grass. And then uh, cichlid fishes in Africa and South America, where you have different species that uh, uh, live sympatrically, or at least in near symp sympatry, that do wildly different things ecologically. 
So I think my computer's acting up now. So I've worked on this um, uh, uh, adaptive radiations and geckos in the past, um, but for my postdoc at the American Museum of Natural History with Frank Berberink, um, I jumped into the world of snakes. Um, and adaptive radiations of sna and snakes are, are uh, uh, sort of ill-defined and snakes are weird amongst lizards because there aren't that many insular radiations. There aren't many uh, island uh, um, systems that have uh, snake uh, assemblages that show a lot of in situ diversification. And most island systems with snakes, uh, they basically have a bunch of unrelated species that sort of independently colonize um, the islands and they don't really share a common ancestor on that island. And the one good example we have of this are snakes in Madagascar. Um, and Madagascar is an island, a large island um, part of uh, that, uh, that's in the Indian Ocean directly to the east of Mozambique. Um, with the Malagasy channel between the two um, countries. You can see here it's highlighted in green. Um, and in addition to having lemurs and tenorex and all sorts of crazy animals, um, crazy mammals on the island, they also have uh, a really diverse uh, reptile assemblage, uh, reptile fauna. And a major part of that are this one group of snakes called the Pseudoxy ropian lamprophyids. Um, just to keep it simple, I'm going to call them gem snakes from now on. And this is a assemblage of about 110 species with 19 or 18 genera um, that are dispersed across the island. And what's crazy is that in terms of geologic time, they're really, really young. So their uh, they're, uh, oldest or possible origin that we know based off of molecular dating, because we don't have fossils for this group, is about 20 million years, 22 million years. And what's cool is that in that short period of time, they've generated a crazy array of phenotypes. Um, that uh, we don't really see in uh, continental assemblages of snakes over the same time scale. And not only they, are they really diverse phenotypically, they're really diverse ecologically. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples here from the field. Um, this is all part of, a, of, a, of this assemblage. Um, and what's really cool here is that you, in the last 22 million years, we've this island assemblage has generated uh, things that look like uh, our North American hognose snakes, this is a genus like a heterodon. We have little guys that fill the same niche as the say of our ring snake, um, ringneck snakes in um, the US, or little leaf um, snakes. Uh, we have arboreal snakes that seem you know, typically very similar to big uh, cat-eyed snakes that we have in the neotropics. There are things that look like uh, that fill the equivalent niches to our North American colubra, or our colubra constrictor, our racers. And then we have vines in several some um, genera of vine snakes that are strictly arboreal. And we also have the only example of a snake species where there is clearly defined uh, sexual dimorphism outside of color, where there's a clearly defined uh, sexual dimorphism in a secondary sexual trait. And here we have this, the genus Langaha. Um, these guys have the male or the female has this Pinocchio nose, I'm sorry, the male has the Pinocchio nose and the female has this leaf shape, they also different colors. So as far as we know, this is the only group of snakes that actually shows this sort of sexual dimorphism. And not only do they differ wildly in external morphology, this is reflected in their internal morphology. So like I said, I do phylogenetics typically and I use molecular data, either a small sampling of the genome or bigger chunks of the genome, that's a subset called phylogenomics. But as well as that, I also use comparative morphology to understand how uh, traits evolve using the molecular tree as a basis. Um, and I've recently gotten into using X-ray computer photography, um, tomography, CT scanning to make these really cool three-dimensional models of these snake skulls so I can quantify shape variation without doing having to destructively sample um, uh, specimens. You know, the Calicad has hundreds of thousands of herps. People usually don't want you skinning them and tearing them apart to get at the bones. And this sort of technology allows us to do this without um, uh, 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 compromising the integrity of our specimens. So here I have representatives of nine different genera of Malagasy snakes. They are wildly different from one another. And this brings me to another point that I wanted to make about this group and why it's a really cool system is that a lot of times when you have an insular radiation um, of, uh, of uh, animals, an adapt a putative adaptive radiation, when you have these clearly defined ecological boundaries between these different lineages, and it's ecology that's driving this, this diversification, um, this increasing, this finer partitioning of niche space, um, what's, what can happen a lot is that you can have a lineage that is quite different than that, the parent lineage, right? So they occupy a unique area of morphospace 
a niche space that doesn't really overlap with uh, the parental lineage. Furthermore, but you can also have this phenomenon of convergent evolution that I'm going to get into a little bit later, um, where you have different lineages that are unrelated, evolving similar phenotypes um, due to selective forces from the environment. And the uh, Malagasy gem snakes, at least on the surface, uh, show this uh, seem to show this pattern. And I was interested in testing whether or not the Malagasy gem snakes, when you compare them to the clay that they are nested within, the, the lineage of snakes that they are nested, nested within, um, if they were vastly different. The fact that they are on the island, has that allowed them to increase their, their niche envelope and phenotype envelope beyond what you see on mainland colubroids? And this is a broad question because colubroids represent about uh, three quarters of all snake species in the world. So there are about 1,700, 1,800 species of colubroids. And you might be asking like, what is a colubroid? Colubroids are the group of snakes that include all the rat snakes, all the corn snakes, all the vipers, all the cobras, all the asp, um, file snakes, king snakes, racers, they're all part of this assemblage. And they're basically advanced derived snakes that are not like boas and blind snakes, uh, pythons. These are not colubroids. So um, the colubroids are really cool because they have just, they're, they're really young. So as far as we know, they don't go, they're, they're not older than uh, about 45 million years, um, this group. And within that time, they've colonized the entire world and they are incredibly diverse in terms of their morphology. But when I quantify the entire skull morphology, when I quantify the shape, not the actual morphology, but when I quantify shape to see if the ecomorphological diversification of gem snakes, the Malagasy gem snakes, exceeds that which you see in the parental lineage, because they are embedded within this family, family of Lamprophidae, we find that the gem snakes are kind of average, right? They sit right in the middle of the morphospace space of um, colubroids. And that the things that are really special are not insular lineages. They're actually these other unrelated lineages, particularly venomous snakes. So here I show, I'm showing you two analyses that uh, where I've quantified selection um, to new adaptive zones in morphospace. And morphospace is this term that we use to describe if you can visualize the morphology um, qualitatively, how uh, different species are similar or dissimilar to each other. So what we find is that the things that are really specialized uh, snakes, just like Harry was talking about, front having fangs in the front of your mouth as opposed to the back of your mouth They're, these are uh there's three basic three basically times types of fangs and snakes there are, are epistoglyphus where you have fangs in the back you have proteroglyphus um which you have fangs in the front that are fixed so that's all cobras and then you have selenoglyphus where the fangs are in the front but they can move they can swing forward like in vipers or sideways like in apex traspid snakes um, and what we find is that these guys that have snakes um, things in the front of the mouth occupy totally independent areas of morphous space from all other snakes, which is not surprising. So the, the actual um, the evolution of, de of novel venom delivery systems seems to be driving um, uh, expansive niche space in colubroids. But again, I just did this for the whole skull. And what happens if you break this down and to, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, just to highlight this, I have some videos of some uh, really derived uh, colubroids. And here I have a viper. This is the Bushmaster, Lachesis. Here you, I have a Lamprophid, Atec Traspis. And these are two independent evolutions of Selenoglyphy. So in both the viper and the Atec Traspid, they can move their entire maxillas, the bone, that, the major bone that bears the teeth in the upper jaw. Um, um, and this is only evolved twice, just like Harry said. And elapids, the proteroglyphus, so the fangs are fixed in the front of the mouth. And when you look at things like uh, uh, the pseudoxyrophines in Madagascar, they sort of just are just like bland, generic snakes in terms of the morphology. They're not really special when you look at the whole skull as a unit. But when you break down the skull into those constituent elements, we find that the patterns are really idiosyncratic, which was not what I was expecting at all. Um, it turns out that different elements show different signals altogether. I'm just going to show you very quickly two different um, elements. And what we find is if we look at the major tooth bearing element of, of the upper jaw that is part of the, 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 the maxillary walk system that snakes use to eat large prey, the maxilla itself, so I've highlighted it here on the, on the right upper part of the screen with this arrow pointing to it. Um, what this 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 uh, is relatively conservative in morphology, and the gem snakes are sort of 
um, fit within the this this um, uh, I mean fit within with other cluboids. And you can see that in the purple, um, these purple dots here. But then the real stars of the show are the viper, uh, not the vipers, the cobras and their relatives. So a lapid. So I wasn't actually able to quantify a cobra. I'm not cobras. I'm getting them mixed up. Vipers and rattlesnakes and stuff because their maxilla are super weird, and it's really hard to find parts that of the maxilla that are homologous or share a common ancestor with the maxilla of less derived snake jaws. So it looks like, again, that we find a signal of uh, 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 that this evolution of, of having derived fangs really drives um, shape in this one element. Then when we look at the back of the skull, that really falls apart. What we find is that the, um, the alapids um, which are part of this assemblage down here, I don't have them labeled here, sort of all are not really special, but the really special guys are the guys that have evolved selenoglyphy. So, uh, but these guys also tend to eat very, very large prey relative to their body size. So what I'm looking at here is the super temporal bone, which is in the back of the skull. And this is a major bone that allows snakes, um, macrostomatin snakes to open their jaws really wide. When the snake is eating, this bone in the back of the skull swings outward and allows the quadrate to um, increase the maximum gape of snakes. And we find that with each element, we find really distinctive patterns of of uh, diversification. They're not telling. They're not all telling the same story. So this brings me to this question of convergent evolution. When you look at the uh, Malagasy snakes. Um, and anybody who does field work in the tropics will say that, you know, I'll, you'll see a snake and you'll be like, that looks like so-and-so from a different part of the world. And as evolutionary biologists, you know that that taxon is not related to the thing you're saying that it looks like. So this highlights this idea of convergent evolution where you have unrelated tax evolving similar phenotypes due to similar selective forces from the environment. And I wanted to ask that about uh, the Malagasy gem snakes. And here, I'm just going to show two examples of and this idea that these, these similar snakes fall within the same purview. We call that ecomorphology, where they're doing mostly the same thing independently. And here, I'm showing several different genera, all none of them are related to each other, of a colubroid that have independently evolved this vine snake morphology, where they're long, thin, visually oriented predators, sometimes lizard specialists living in trees. The other is the hognose snake morphology, and this is just... These are just a handful, a couple of examples of many amongst snakes, where you have these stout, heavy body terrestrial guys that are sometimes eating um, frogs uh, that uh, are, and all of them are rear fang. They're epistoglyphous um, living on the ground and they have these upturned rostral scales um, and uh, relatively large eyes. And just as two examples in the, like we have three examples in Madagascar, but then in the New World we have this genus Xenodon, and here in North America uh, we have Heterodon, uh, which is our local hognose snake. And when we actually quantify the, the this across the skull, we find that gem snake, not gem snakes, vine snake morphology has evolved multiple times when you look at the skull as a unit, and that the hognose snake morphology. It turns out the skull morphology, when you look at it as a unit, tell, is they're totally different from on the inside, which is actually not what I was expecting. It's really surprising. You can see here we have two Malagasy gem snakes. It looks like when you quantify the entire skull, um, the Malagasy hognose snakes aren't, aren't that different than other colubroids. But then we have heterodon and xenodon have really derived morphologies. They're almost as the, the, the Euclidean distance and morphology between them and other colubroids is almost as great as the difference you see between vipers and cobras to other colubroids. But this pattern of convergence that we see within some of these other groups um, actually breaks down when you look at the individual elements like I showed you before. When you look at say the maxilla or the brain case or the, uh, some of these other bones in the roof of the mouth, it turns out these snakes are actually um, really different from each other and that the whole, this whole the com compiled unit leads to a similar phenotype. So the me mechanistically and biomechanically, they're probably doing things very differently as far as we can tell. But in terms of superficially, externally, when you put them all together, they're making the same thing work as a unit um, and to look the same. And this is this phenomenon that we call many to one mapping and um, evolutionary biology, where you can have a superficially similar um, uh, structure, but then the constituent units are, are uh, structurally or developmentally or biomechanically different, but the function is the same once it, um, they're all put together. 
So in conclusion, and I, I think I may have gone a little bit over, um, but in conclusion, what's really cool is that we find that because convergent evolution is multifaceted in, in, this, in this group of snakes or just across advanced snakes in general, that, you know, uh, it, it's just like um, Akabo said is that, you know, snakes are basically like a, a head with a body and a tail, right? They're a tube, but there's not many axes that, the, that selection can act upon. So there's a really strong aspect of deterministic evolution. Um, this is what we use to describe convergence, that if you're going to be a snake that does this, you're going to have to have this shape. And to have this shape, you're going to have to change your elements in whatever way works to achieve this shape. And what's really cool is that the, the, the snakes in Madagascar, even though they aren't really special in terms of their morphology, um, compared to other snakes, they broadly overlap with other um, advanced snakes, is um, is the fact that in this amount of time, they've been able to rapidly generate the phenotypes that you see in other parts of the world. So they've been able to basically replicate almost all phenotypes except for the really derived venom delivery systems that you see in um, other group unrelated colubroids um, uh, uh, multiple times which is really, really cool. Um, as far as I know, no one's really been able to show this using CT data um, for advanced snakes. And what's this also, these data also show, this is still a work in progress, by the way. Um, this data also show that uh, selection doesn't necessarily act on the entire skull as a unit. Um, that these different elements, you're basically working with what you have um, due to your, there's a contingency of ancestry um, within this group. And like I said before, it seems that you can, achieve overall the same phenotype and um, occupy the same niche by changing different elements in different ways. Um, but uh, in concert, they accomplish the same same goal. So with that, um, I'd like to conclude and uh, thank Raina Bell for inviting me to participate um, in this symposium. Um, and also this research wouldn't be possible with a lot of, without a lot of help and from my advisors and uh, people who are better at programming than me. So thank you. Thank you. Also, thank you for referring to this as a symposium. I think that makes us sound a lot fancier than we are. So I appreciate it. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was that was fascinating. It's crazy to think there's so many questions and answers in a snake skull. So that was, yeah, really incredible. And we have questions for all of our panelists. So if we could bring everybody back on. Um, I have a handful for all of you, but also if anyone gets asked something that other people have stuff they want to chime in on, please do. Um, and I should say too, we've got a lot of questions from, view or a lot of comments from viewers who are saying that you all deserve much longer to talk. So <laughs> we'll, we'll invite you all back for some longer, um, longer prezos later. But I'm going to start with just in the order they were asked. Um, so Harry, Jake, Jake, and what I was trying, what I was actually saying without being heard to you when we were on screen together awkwardly was that um, the idea that snakes were kind of already there waiting for us is really kind of profound and amazing. And Jake's question kind of uh, relates to that. He would like to know, have snakes, have snakes gotten smaller over time, like insects, or are they sort of sticking to their original niches? Ooh, what a great question. And I'm afraid, can you hear me okay? Are we all broadcasting fine? Perfect. Okay. Um, the answer is not simple. In fact, if you look at the most basal living snakes, that is the living remnants of the earliest divergence in snakes, they're all relatively small. Okay, they're what we call blind snakes, and they're relatives. And the largest ones are no larger than a, a, a small garter snake. So they started out relatively small. There's really good evidence that fairly early on snake evolution, you've got gigantism evolving repeatedly. And we still have some gigantic snakes around today. So I, I would say there's not a simple answer to that. It's not a clear pattern. Okay, great. Non-answers non are also answers. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, Hakobo, from Jonathan, um, do you think it's harder to get protections for venomous snakes than other species? Uh, probably. Uh, that might be probably the case. I see in Mexico, it doesn't really matter what you are. It's really hard to get get mm. some sort of conservation measurement. Uh, you know, people are afraid of uh, venomous snakes. There's also a lot of people that love them. Um, but yeah, it might be harder to protect the rattlesnake than to protect the jaguar, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, Harry, do you have thoughts on that too? You, that kind of intersects with your work? Well, it, it's a little paradoxical in the US because among the first uh, snakes really protected, especially in the United States, were certain small Arizona rattlesnakes. And that was uh, something like 70 years ago. So that still surprises me in retrospect. 
but um, mostly it's going to be it's going to be tougher because these animals can potentially hurt us. And, and my reaction to that is, if you want people to care about something that can hurt you, you've got to largely solve the problem of the of the risk to human health. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, do you all have standard kind of responses for if, when you encounter people who think who don't like who just immediately don't like snakes or think they're scary or think they're awful? And and Philip, maybe we'll start with you since um, you're next up. Oh, I can't hear you. You're muted. This is an easy problem to solve, not a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I that's a really hard question to answer. I. Uh, I usually just try to explain to people that, I mean, first off, snakes aren't trying to get you. You know, they're not out to get you. They're more scared of you than you are of them. And the vast majority of them aren't dangerous. You know, the vast majority of them are completely harmless. We happen to live, if you live here in Europe, the vast majority of them are, are even the venomous ones typically don't really result in human fatalities in developed countries. Um, and most of the time it's just, uh, you know, even for the dangerous ones, if you live somewhere like in Australia, if you just give them their due respect, um, there's, there's no risk, right? So it's a, I just feel like it's a, try to gently educate them to the right. reality of snake biology. Right. Harry, Hakavo, any thoughts? Um, well, this is kind of like a, something that I've been changing my, my view in, especially in recent years, because a lot of people get really, really heated, you know, when they see a snake that some farmer killed or something like that. And it's like, oh, you have to educate them. You have to educate them. However, you know, some of these remote communities, there's no services, there's nothing, and the risk of getting bit by something is just extreme. You know, you don't want your kid to be bitten by a coral snake or a rattlesnake, and you're not going to be like, oh, my God, how many how many bands does it have? Does the L'Oreal touches this other scale or, or the color? So, like, the risk for them, it's huge. So it, it's not like they're, they're destroying the species like a mine is or like an avocado field is. So... You know, it, it, it sucks when people kill them in these rural areas, but, you know, what, what, what are they supposed to do? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't get, like, super heated, and I'm, I'm actually more angry at biologists that get angry at these people. And it's like, well, it's, it's not your life at risk. It's not your kid's life at risk when it comes about getting bitten. If somebody, you know, in the city or whatever, it's killing snakes and whatever, it actually doesn't, it, it's no harm to them. Uh, then, yeah, it might be easier to get angry, but, you know, it's farmers in, in some remote communities, well, you know, it is what it is, and it's whatever. Sad, but, you know, I understand. Right. Really different different question in different places. Yeah, that's helpful to know. Um, Harry, did you want to add anything, or should I keep going? Oh, just keep going. I think okay. they're doing fine. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, well, uh, um, Philip, and you go by Skip, is that right? Should I switch over? Okay or only for friends or, okay. Um, so you, the question that you, your question, this one's from Pete, and I think this is gonna be a hard one to answer, but it was, um, do you think there's a single biggest mystery in snake diversification today? Oh yeah, um, I, I, a single biggest mystery. I think mostly that, that one of the most contentious things is, uh, you know, the origin, where what snakes, the earliest snakes were doing. You know, mm -hmm. in the fossil record. So, were they fossil? There's a, two schools of thought. The earliest snakes were fossorial, or they were acquiring about this until the end of days. Um, I don't. I don't think it's a question that we're ever really gonna have any answer to. Oh, that's really cool, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's super cool. All of them yeah. but, but yeah, you know, the fossil okay. record is pretty bad. So, okay, cool. Thank you. Um, Harry, uh, Linnea asked the the innate mechanisms that you referenced primate, primates having specific, uh, sorry. So the innate mechanisms that you referenced primates having, are those truly specific to snakes or would those apply to a range of different threats? Yeah, that, and that's a great question. And it turns out people are actually looking at some of those other threats like spiders, for example. And so there's actually a, a pretty big research program uh, started quite a long time ago, but but getting ever more sophisticated that that asks questions about how do, for example, both young children and young non-human primates respond to specific attributes of other objects. So snakes have specific attributes. They're long and slender. They often have cross paws or spots in their color pattern. And you can do things like ask a young monkey or ask a young child with a known history of never having seen a snake or yes or no and so forth. You can ask them questions like, if I only give you 300 milliseconds to look at 12 different objects, which one is the snake? 
Oh. Or which one is the mushroom? Or which one is the spider? And it turns out if you give either a toddler or a monkey, a non-human primate, a second to look at all those possibilities, they can pick any of them out. If you give them about half that much, they can still pick out spiders and snakes. And if you give them only about a third of a second, about 300 milliseconds, they get snakes every time, but they can no longer pick up mushrooms and spiders. So that's just one example of the kinds of research. And, and there's quite a lot. All of it points to these innate recognition mechanisms, but it doesn't suggest we're necessarily innately afraid. That likely comes in with experience, cultural processes and so forth, yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, you know, so here's a here's a hard hitting follow up, which is: Have you seen all those videos when people were putting cucumbers behind their cats to scare yes, them? I did see those. Yeah, <laughs> do you yeah. Think that has implications for snake research. <laughs> well, it might. It's a really interesting thing to do, and I'd like to see it done in a very controlled way, with an array of domestic and wild cats, and with an array of domestic and wild dog relatives, and so forth. Because if you you probably noticed this, even among the cat stuff. You know, somebody would say, oh, cats are terrified of zucchini. And then the next next YouTube video would be somebody's cat who couldn't care less about a zucchini, right? <laughs> so we need to, we'd have to understand what that variation means. Okay. Yeah, I know that. The, okay, that makes sense. Um, thank you for that. And I'll ask you all one more kind of suite of questions. And um, I don't want, since we're, since we're coming on time, but um, I hope you don't mind if I keep you just a little bit longer. Uh, Harry, before I let you go, Kristen wanted to know, how does a snake actually catch a primate? Monkeys seem so fast relative to a big snake. Yeah, so you, you just have to understand these are ambush predators. So snakes, everything about, not everything, but a lot about being a snake is not ever being found. So typically their color patterns are very cryptic. They set up ambush next to some place that's likely to yield an encounter with a prey item, like like the Madagascan ground boy I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually the potential prey has no idea what hit them. They're walking along and the next thing they know, they're rolled, rolled up in the coils of a, of a boa constrictor or a reticulated python. And unless something extraordinary happens, about a minute later, you're dead. Okay. Thanks for that was very very visual. Thank you. <laughs> um, so Erica asks, do you take any special precautions on research trips, knowing that you're in pro you're in proximity with people involved in the drug trade? Um, yeah, so it's we've been working in these areas for many many years. So it's not like we go right now to to place. I mean, we still do, um, but most of the places that we go, the people know us. Uh, they are usually really nice people. A lot of people have this idea that the people are growing the opium or the marijuana are these like, you know, like uh, banditos and, and, and they're terrible people. But no, they're just farmers. They're trying to make a living. They're not, they're not getting rich. Uh, they're just selling their stuff to the cartels. Many times they're, they're you know, they, they, they have to. They're not like the other choice. Uh, so they, they're really nice people. So they're just like us and stuff like that. But, you know, you never go unannounced to a place you you – we usually carry, you know, our credentials that we're biologists. They usually don't care um, once they know that we're biologists. Um, before, uh, before, yeah, we, we, we take risks. We never take weapons anywhere. That's like the worst idea in the world. A lot of people in the U.S. is because they, you guys are so used to having carrying weapons all the time. It's like, oh, you bring your AK-47. was like, no, 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 that's the worst thing that you can do. You just need to show them that you don't care what they're doing and you understand that that that's what they do and, and, and you're just here looking for snakes and whatnot. So, so you know, it's, 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 it's still risky, but it's not that we're pretending that we're like some hardcore Rambo guys or anything like that. We're just like a bunch of nerdy uh, biologists that, that are really interested into these areas and, and, and you know, just try to be friendly with the people and uh, tell them straight ahead what we're doing in these areas. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. It's like, it's just agriculture at some level. If you're a farmer just trying to grow things, it's, yeah, okay. Um, so, and then this question for you from Robert, uh, do you think there are new long-tailed rattlesnakes left to discover and where do you predict they may be? <laughs> uh, yes, there's potential for, for them uh, in two areas of Mexico and Southern Mexico. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to know more about this uh, this summer. Um, okay. We'll, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Great. Is Harry, Robert someone you know? If, you wanna, if Harry, if you want to come and join us, uh, and Philip, if you want to 
join us too in the expeditions. You guys are more than welcome. So awesome. What about me? No? Okay. Oh, sure. um, <laughs> uh, for Skip, um, so Jen says the CT scans are amazing. Um, is there any emerging tech that you're watching that you think will drive your science even more? Oh man, um, I, I'm sh the answer is I don't know. Um, I yes, I uh, I think that technology is always you know 20 years ago, 30 years ago, nobody would have thought we'd be able to do this right. you know outside of a hospital. So um, now you can buy these industrial scanners. Uh, they're still expensive. Uh, I think the one technology I'm really interested in is get is uh, something called phase contrast CT scanning. Um, oh. So, uh, which allows you to CT scan soft tissue or tissue that's not radio opaque um, without having to change the density of the tissue, which is what I do now. I, I soak stuff in the iodine if I oh. want a CT scan, and the, and which is destructive. Right. Um, so I would like to be able to do that one day, but right now the technology doesn't like to scan anything bigger than this, really, maybe the size of a mouse. So be able to do something bigger would be nice. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to read you this last question from Chris. Uh, is anyone looking at the possibility of convergent genetic elements, mutations, or gene expression pathways that are associated with a vine snake or hog nose ecomorphs, possibly associated with behaviors, diets, or body forms? Uh, so that's a really good question. And I am sure some, I mean, this is something that I would, I'm hoping to get into in the next couple of years is uh, doing trait genome associations. Um, those are really, really complex traits, and we don't even really have a good understanding of that in, in most model vertebrates for, for which we have good genomes, and we just don't have good sampling across uh, squamates for genomes mm -hmm. um, to um, that are published or, and well annotated yet. We, we barely even understand like the genomics of venom evolution. In fact, by barely, I mean we don't understand it at all. Um, so, uh, so the answer is yes, and we're not there yet. Okay. Okay. Um, and I'm going to close with this question from Alice, and I'll ask all of you, uh, do you ever dream about snakes? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yep. Since I was a child. Excellent. And for you, Hagaro? Yeah, yeah. I would, I would dream that I was catching all these uh, rattlesnakes, you know, and then I would wake up and I was like, oh, man. I'm still looking for these things. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, thank you all again so much for your time. This really has been fascinating. And I really would welcome all of you to come back and do longer talks on one of our other series. So we'll reach out about that. There's definitely a demand. Um, yeah, again, thank you so much. It was incredible. And uh, viewers come back at 4 p.m. Sorry, 2 p.m. Pacific which is 5 p.m. East Coast for uh, our next Snake Patrick's Day live program. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye.